Hey, welcome to River Rock Fellowship Online Messages. I'm Pastor Marvin. Really glad you're here. You know, if you're a guest, feel free to go to rrf.church and check us out. If you want to be able to give to the ministry, hey, there will be a slide afterwards, and there's three different ways, and we would just be so blessed by your contribution. You know, we are in a world that just seems to be in utter chaos. Have you ever been in a situation where you had two groups of people, one saw this thing that way, and the other one saw the same identical thing that way? What do you do in that situation when you feel like you just can't trust anything? Well, we're going to dive into that today, that we would be able to focus on the main thing. Well, let's worship together, watch this video, and then comes my message. Father, I pray blessing on your people. I pray we would have ears to hear, hearts that would just be open to the Word of God. And Father, Lord, the willingness to obey what God wants us to do. Father, bless your people in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Wow, isn't that true? Especially when our world is clearly in chaos. It just seems like life is just all out of focus. Hard to see, hard to understand, and it just seems like so much is just out of focus and completely a blur. You know, I've been there. Um, growing up as a kid and finding out from some distant relative, and I didn't even know her name, I found out the truth about my little eight-year-old life at the time and that it was all a lie. I found out I was adopted. I found out that my parents were not my parents and that they were my aunt and my uncle from a complete stranger that I didn't know in the family. Want to talk about how confusing it was, how it brought how it brought my life in such a place that it wasn't just blurry. I couldn't bring anything into focus. Not in my little eight-year-old mind. Now, here we are, and we're all watching from the sidelines as, as our world and as our country appears to be just self-imploding. It appears that there is this full frontal assault on our liberty and on our freedoms. We struggle to trust any news organization, social media, and all of the censoring that is going on. As though if there's no such thing as a constitutional right to free speech. The banning of a duly elected president from communicating to the people. It can make it hard for any of us to see anything clearly. It can make it incredibly difficult to try to focus. Maybe, maybe you too. Maybe you feel like so many important things about our nation's life that your life just feels like it's a big lie. Because people all around have not been honest. That so many things that should be that you should be able to rely on, that you should be able to trust, that it's just all in question. That law and order is now being used as a weapon to be used against those who disagree with the powerful? That justice is not the same for everyone? Like an eight-year-old boy being told by a stranger, that I was adopted, and that now my whole world was not what I thought it was, that it was a lie. So, what do you do? What do you do when everything is so blurry and that you just can't even see straight? What do you do when you have more than one story Regarding the facts. Some say the election results are true and reliable and there's no need for an investigation about voter fraud. Others say that the election was stolen, that they have evidence that the Supreme Court will not even consider to view as a case. What do you do when you have conflicting stories regarding a single story? Well, The main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. There's a story about Yogi Berra, the well-known catcher of the New York Yankees, and Hank Aaron. Well, he was a baseball home run king, and uh, he played as a power hitter for the Milwaukee Braves. Well, Hank Aaron comes up to the plate, and you know, Yogi Berra, like he always is, he was just a chatterbox. He was always trying to pep up the team and trying to real get in the mind of each and every batter if he could. So here comes Hank, and as he gets up to the plate, Yogi goes, hey, Henry. He says, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to turn it so you can read the label. That pitch comes in. 
And just as that pitch comes in, Hank Aaron got his grip and he swung as hard as he could. He put that ball over the left field fence into the bleachers, and we're talking deep. He rounds all the bases, first, second, third, comes home, steps on the plate. Plate looks right at Yogi Berra, the catcher, looks him right in the eye and says, I didn't come here to read. <laughs> I didn't come here to read a label. You see, Henry, he understood that he was not going to be easily distracted by anything. He was on a mission. You know, as a Christian, as a Christian man, as a Christian woman of God, it's easy and somewhat, you know, understandable to be impacted by things that want to draw your attention away from the main thing, from focusing on what God wants us all to be focusing on no matter what's going on in the world. Folks, when life is just in an uproar, then when we need, that's when we need to be more vigilant about keeping our eyes on Jesus. Have you ever tried to do something where you really need your focus? I mean, have you ever tried to do something and if you didn't pay attention, you weren't focusing, what would happen? I mean, try driving a vehicle not focusing on the road. Try riding a bicycle, not focusing on your balance. We've all had people in our lives growing up telling us to, hey, pay attention, or hey, look at what you're doing. Or a coach who says, I need you to focus right now, or keep your eye on the ball. You know, we have had people in our life who told us these kinds of things. Because they knew the importance of focus. They knew that if we were not focused, we wouldn't be successful in sports and academics and relationships. Or even in life. See, this is a God principle. To keep your eyes on Jesus. Even in the midst of a storm. In the midst of a tempest. Have you ever been in a life-threatening storm? Oh my goodness, one year my wife and I, uh, we gathered up the kids, and we have five kids, so we had to use two vehicles to get all the gear and the kids. And, and we got to our campsite, got all our camp all set up. We were doing good, getting ready to go fishing. And just like that, you know what they say about Iowa, if you don't like the weather, just give it 15 minutes, you'll get a whole new set of whatever coming at you. And out of nowhere... Bam! This lightning bolt hits about 50 to 100 feet away, hits the water, the little lake right next to us. And before you know it, the wind is coming. We find out later it's like 70, 80 mile hour straight winds. And oh my goodness, the downpour and the rain. Well, we gathered up all the kids, we got them into the vehicles. And my wife and I, we're getting drenched. We're doing our best to batten down the tent, make sure our equipment isn't going to get destroyed. And, and while this is happening, one of our kids, Hunter, he's, he's little. He's a little guy at this time. And he just starts to pray. And he says, oh, Jesus, save my mom, save my dad, save my family. Just take me. And oh, we laugh and we think, wow, how cute that is and on how a little boy would pray such a prayer in a moment of a severe, life-threatening storm. But you know, he's the one who had it right. His focus was on the one who could save in the middle of a life-threatening storm. He got it out of the mouth of babes, right? Well, in the New Testament, there's a famous story of Jesus and the disciples, Peter in specific, and of course, a storm. Let's look at it together in Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. Now, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. Let's get a little backstory. Jesus just found out that day that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed unjustly. 
had been beheaded, beheaded. And he went to this place to be in to be in a in a solitude place where he could just pray and be with the Lord because he's grieving. Well, while he takes off to get over there, the masses find out what he's doing. They follow him, and he feeds them, 5,000 people. He prays for the sick. He just ministers to everybody. And now he tells the guys, hey, you know, get in the boat and take off, and I'll see you on the other side, because he still needed his time with the Lord to grieve. So here's where we picked that up. Now let's go back to verse 23. After sending them home, that's the people, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone, 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Jesus immediately responds to the wrong conclusion that the disciples had come up with. Have you ever noticed that in fear, most people do not see things clearly or accurately? That we make up, well, we use assumptive thinking can get us into a lot of trouble. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. 28. Then Peter called him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me, he, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Now, do you catch that word, why? Jesus didn't say, what caused you to doubt me? He says, why? See, the word why means something very different. Whenever I use the word why, I am searching for the motivation. I am searching for a heart condition that made a person do what they did or not do what they did. It's a heart question. When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Verse 33. Then the, di- then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Well, as long as Peter had his focus on Jesus, he was experiencing the supernatural. He was walking on water like his, like his Savior, like his rabbi. He was doing that which the other eleven didn't even attempt to do. But when he took his eyes off Jesus and he looked at the wind and he looked at the waves, and wait a minute, wasn't there a storm before he walked out there? He lost his focus. Whenever I lose my focus is when I'm going to lose my confidence. It's when I'm going to be open to doubt and to fear. And when I doubt and fear, I forfeit my belief and my faith in Jesus. And all of a sudden, that unbelief, that doubt, that fear is not a foundation I can use to stand while I'm walking on water, while I'm facing anything, even a storm of life. Hmm. Well, you know, there's another Bible story that I want us to be reminded of. It's the story of when Israel refused to enter and possess the promised land of God. Now, most of us remember the story of the children of Israel, the Hebrews. You know, how they exited from from the slavery of Egypt. We recall that God had promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. And we know 
that because of unbelief, because of disobedience, because of doubt and fear and rebellion, the trip that should have taken, some scholars say 11 days, so we're talking less than a couple weeks, ended up going to 40 years. And it was so expensive that it cost the lives of a whole generation. When you're talking 2 million people, you lose a whole generation. That is a huge number. So let's turn and look at this book called Deuteronomy, chapter 1. And, and the book opens up, and again, Moses is the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible. And, and Moses is, is recapping the story, the events, the history of the Hebrews up to this point in time. And it reads, starting at verse 21, Look, the Lord your God has set the, the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. I mean, there's a directive. There's a promised land. God says it's yours. Go possess it. Go take it. I mean, that's it. Conversation should be over. Let's load up our gear. Let's go. Now let's look at verse 22. And every one of you came near to me, Moses said. Let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us by the way by, by which we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come. Then the plan pleased me well, so I took 12 of your men and one man from each tribe. And they departed and went up into the mountains and came to the valley of Ishkol and spied it out. It's interesting when you go into Numbers chapter 13, you find that God permitted this reconnaissance. This wasn't God's plan, but God gave his permissive will. This wasn't God's holy will. Verse 24, and they departed and went up to the mountains and came to the valley of Ishkol and spied it out. 25, they also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents. And said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Those are the giants. Then I said to you, this is Moses. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God, who, gives, who goes before you, He will fight for you. According to all He did for you in Egypt before your eyes. 31. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God. He's saying, look at all these miracles. I mean, folks, we've got to remember, while they were still in Egypt, they went knocking on the doors and said, we want gold and silver and precious things. And the people, the residents, they literally gave them, they plundered all of Egypt and loaded it all up on their wagons, and they carried all that riches and that plunder with them. Then they get to the Red Sea and God does a miracle and they all cross on dry land and then Pharaoh's army goes in and they are destroyed and, they're drown and they drown. He provides manna from heaven. And quail. Now they're at the promised land and they're saying, oh, <laughs> there's giants in the land. Wasn't there problems at the Red Sea? Wasn't there problems when you were a slave? Didn't God do all the ten plagues and rescue you? They don't see 
Their memory is selective. Verse 33, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go. In the fire by night and in the cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of this evil generation. Did you see that? This generation had doubt. This generation had fear. This generation was rebelling against the will of God and was disobeying. And God in turn said, this rebellious generation, I'm taking away my blessing. I'm taking away my favor. You're going to wander in the desert for 40 years. Verse 36. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I am giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. Wow. The Lord was also angry with me, meaning Moses, for your sake, saying, even you shall not go in there. Not, he will not go into the promised land. Verse 38. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him. For he shall cause Israel to inherit it. You know, as we study the Hebrew people, we discover that most, that for the most part, they found themselves living in, in one of three places. So in your hand on, if your notes, the Hebrew people found themselves living in one of three places. One, as slaves under bondage. Two, as wanderers in the wilderness, and three, as people enjoying God's promised land. I've also discovered like the Hebrew people live in one of those three places that, that people, that we can live in those one of three places as well. We can live in a spiritual slavery. Being enslaved to sin or to a grudge or to an unforgiveness to an addiction to something that brings us into slavery away from a glorious relationship with God and two we can be in the wilderness just wandering throughout life not having any purpose or direction and yet we need we needed God to rescue us and he rescued us and we got saved but now because we're not rooted in his word and we're not active in our faith all of a sudden we just feel like we're just wandering with no purpose with no meaning with no direction and all seems for not vanity and then we also have that opportunity to live in the promises of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit and living under the guidance of the will and the ways of God. The anointing, the blessing, the favor, able to see beyond the giant problems and the obstacles because we know how great is our God. You know, every four years in the summer, the world turns its attention to the Olympic Games. For a few days, men and women from around the globe, they all gather together. And literally, they will set brand new athletic records, whether track and field or the swim and all sorts of different kinds of sports. And, you know, for decades, track and field experts they just proudly declared that no runner was capable of breaking the four-minute mark on the one-mile race. It was said that a human being was not able to run that fast for that long of a distance. The experts, the experts conducted all sorts of profound studies to show that it was impossible to beat the four-minute mark. And for years, they were right. Nobody ever ran under four minutes. But one day, a young man 
came along who didn't believe what the experts said. He didn't dwell on the negative reports of the impossibilities because it's a giant marker that can never be broken. He refused to let all those negative words form a stronghold in his mind, in his spirit. He focused on all the possibilities. And he began to train, believing for victory. And sure enough, in 1952, the Summer Olympic Games, he broke the four-minute mile barrier. He did what the experts said could not be done. His name was Roger Bannister, and he made sports history. Now, here's what's so interesting about the Roger Bannister story. Within a month, 30 days, the Australian runner John Landy, he broke Bannister's record. (laughs) Then Bannister came back and went to the, well, they're called the British empire games and he broke landy's record of the four minute under four minute mile the mile of the century came together and and at first it was 358.8 and excuse me landy was 3.59 and then bannister came and got at 3.58 within 10 years of roger bannister breaking the four-minute mile, within 10 years, there were over 336 other individuals who broke the four-minute mile. For hundreds of years, there was never a record of anybody breaking the four-minute mile barrier. What happened? It was simple. The barrier to running a four, less than a four-minute mile was now all that the athletes could ever think of. There was a mental block. It had fear. It can't be done. It's a sub four minute mile giant monster. For all those years, runners believed the lie. They believed the false story. They were convinced that it was impossible. Roger Bannister is in many ways the Joshua and Caleb that went into the the promised land to do the reconnaissance. They believed for the impossible to take place because God had said it. Well, you know, the runners from generations past who never broke the 400, the, the four minute mile mark, they too were like the 10 other spies with Joshua, with Caleb. They all saw the same thing. They saw the huge grapes. Can you imagine? It took two people to carry one cluster of grapes and it made the wood bow down as they were carrying it. They saw a land full of milk and honey. They saw everything that Joshua and Caleb saw. But somehow, the only thing they could see were the giants. The giant obstacles. Folks, we're all facing some really severe things in our nation. I don't know who's going to be president. But I'll tell you what. I'm a monarchist. I believe in a king. I serve only King Jesus. It doesn't matter who's president as long as King Jesus is on the throne. He'll guide us through this all. He has a hope and a future for us. We have to be convinced that greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. Folks, what are you focusing on? The news, the corruption, this story, that story. Oh, how hypocritical they are. Or are you studying the word of God? Are you spending time with Jesus and he will guide you? 
on how to take your next step closer to Jesus, even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of mixed messages from the same group of people that you're supposed to be able to trust. He will never lie to us and he will always guide us. For he says that he will never leave us or forsake us. We're in good hands. Make sure you're keeping the main thing, Jesus, the main thing. He'll take you by the hand and he'll guide you. Father, I pray a blessing on your people. Help us to have faith to believe. Father, even in the midst of a a crazy report, that, Lord, we can see the victory because nothing's impossible with you, Jesus. Oh, bless your people. Lift up their spirits, I pray. Give them hope. Give them that joy that God is for them. And we pray your will, we pray your way in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless, church.